Church, it's great to be with you guys once again. Wherever you are tuning in from this morning, I encourage you to just set aside everything you're doing and just commit this time to the Lord. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we want to commit this time to you. We pray that God, as we worship you, may your presence saturate our hearts and our homes. Lord, we commit this service into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing be thou my vision. We thank you, Lord, that He is our vision. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me. Say. i 
come again to join at the table of Holy Communion. Before I go into the communion, let me just read from the Gospel according to John, uh, reading from verse 44. 
Then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe only in me, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. What wonderful revelation for us when Jesus said that, that when we see Jesus, we see the Father. He and the Father are one. He is God Himself. And God Himself has come to give us eternal life. But not only eternal life, but light. Light into our darkness. This world is full of darkness. And in our darkness, whether it is our own lives or in this world as a whole, we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And He, His way, His light will let us and allow us to live life according to His way and in His fullness. So this morning as we come to join in communion, let us remember that. Let us remember that even in our most difficult times, that Jesus is the light into our darkness. Let us pray. Jesus, as you have said, you are the light. You are the light into our dark world. I pray, Lord, that right now, whoever is in darkness, having a tough time, that, Lord, you shine your light into that dark place and bring your life, your light, your hope, your mercy, and your grace. And we pray, God, that indeed, when we come at this table here, share a time with you, you remind us that we don't come frivolously, but we come with thankful hearts. But also, Lord, a uh, brokenness of knowing that there are times when we have sinned against you. We pray, God, that you teach us your way, teach us to journey in your steps, so that, Lord, we will please you and we will see your glory found in Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. saying, This cup is the new covenant, covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake today the Holy Communion and let the world know that it, indeed it is Christ in us, the hope of God. So that the world will know that there is hope and there is love. Let's together partake the communion. Let us take up the bread. This is the bread of This is the blood of the new covenant. Lord, we thank you for Christ Jesus. On the cross, he died for us. From the tomb, he rose in resurrection to give us life and life eternal. And as he sits next to you right now, ascended into the heaven, we pray that God, you continue to minister to us by your Spirit and you give us the hope as we look forward to for the return of our King and our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. We often go to wise men for advice. This morning, as we turn to the wise man Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5 and 6, we're not going to get just uh, 
advice. We are going to get more than advice. We're going to get from him uh, red flags, warning, telling us there are dangers. What sort of dangers are there? Dangers of living life under the sun, living life without God in the scheme of life for us. And this is done after he has done so much inquiry about what life is all about. From verse, from chapter 1 to 2 to 3 and 4, he has made his inquiry and he has come to some assumptions and some understanding. But now in chapter 5 and chapter 6, he's going to do, some, he's going to do something different. What he's going to do is to show us that there are dangers living under the sun. And these perils can affect us and affect the way we live our life and what there is in terms of meaning or meaninglessness of life. What are the four points or the four dangers he raises up? First, he raises up foolish worship. Foolish worship. Secondly, he says that there is bound to be abuse of the powerful. Those who are in power will abuse power. Three, he says that you will accumulate much, you will have much, but you will not have anything at all. There's this sense of having a lot, but not having at all. And fourthly, he says that you will experience much in this life, but you will never be satisfied. Now, what am I going to do is I'm going to lead us through what Solomon writes throughout the, the whole two chapters. And I'm going to stop along the way as he raises up the perils. And I'm going to say to us, how would a Christian respond to this? So that we are careful that we don't fall into traps that that, uh, that Satan throws for us living under the sun without God in the scheme of our lives. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We ask you that even as we hear thy word, Lord, may you be the authority over my lips and my mind and my heart and my soul and my spirit. May you also be the authority over my brothers and sisters wherever they are. Holy Spirit, be the supreme authority over them and over their household. And Lord, I pray that your word preached will return to you in its fullness, giving us, Lord, the mighty transformation of our lives towards Christ-likeness. Because it is in his name we pray. Amen. What is the first red flag? What is the first danger sign? He calls it foolish worship. It is found in chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 7. Let me read that. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools fulfilling to fu fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you to sin. And do, ne do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow is a mistake. Why should God be angry at you what you say? and destroy the work of your hands. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. What is the sacrifice of the foolish? The first thing he says actually is this, watch your steps when you approach God. You know, the Jews, it's very interesting. I mean, in the all of this that he's saying that God is not in the scheme of things, he brings the Jewish people uh, and understanding that in the scheme of things, God may not be there, you may not consider God in your life, but the Jews will still go to the temple to make sacrifices. Now, they have not stopped worshipping God, but it is very interesting that worship, why do they continue worshipping God when God is not uh, a part of their lives at all? Because worship is fashionable. Uh, it's a fashionable thing. Worship is a family thing. All of us Go there for worship. Worship is a festival thing. When there's a festival, we go. Worship is also an assurance, a guarantee that I am meeting what is God's minimum demand, that God won't be angry. Worship was a way also 
to use God. What do I mean by that? You know, uh, it's okay what uh, Solomon writes here. He says that he goes there and you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. You know, one of the things that we realize is that people can come to God and do trade off with God. You know, God, I vow that I will do this if you do this for me. You know, if you bless me, I will, I will do it. That's a bargain between them and God. I vow, I swear, I will change all, uh, over. Now, just in case we think that we don't do it anymore, we have heard it very many, many times that we will change over. Oh, I will change over. God, if you do this for me, I won't gamble anymore. If you, if you do this for me, I will stop smoking. If you do this for me, I will pass my, if I, I will pass my exams and, and heal me. You know, I do this, please heal me. And if I do this, can you help me financially? We bargain with God, we use God. These are dangerous traps because we trivialize who God is. You know, he reminds the people that God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Do not spew words unnecessarily. You know, and he says that the reason really perhaps is that we forget who God is. Now I'm going to come back to this part about forgetting who God is. But truly, when God is not in the scheme of your life, coming to, to worship is just for family, for fashion, and so on and so forth. When we see that God is being trivialized in their lives. Another way is about when words become foolish sacrifice is, you know what James says in uh, chapter 3 verse 10, we curse and we praise with the same lips. You know, these are really a, 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 a taboo for even, even, even if we are not uh, uh, Christians. But the thing about it is that James says we curse and we praise with the same lips. We gossip, we uh, we say th things that we think that we are better than others and then we put others down. You know, we have a sense of superior superiority. Tim Keller uh, has written a book before and he says this, that do not idolize yourself. Do not make yourself an idol. When we raise ourselves above others, we are actually idolizing ourselves. We relegate God to body. You know, one of the things that in this age and time, I think, mostly in this age and time, we make God our buddy. We forget that we need to revere Him. Yes, my friends, Jesus did call us His friends, or at least He calls His disciples and those who believe His friends. But if you read uh, John 15, 15, and also Matthew 24, you realize that He calls them friends for a reason. And that is, as friends, I can tell you my deepest thoughts. I can give you revelation. It is not so that you are my buddy, buddy, but you are. You now have a responsibility. You now have an accountability to me, and you now know the secrets of the kingdom and what is to come. And your work is then, therefore, to bring the good news to the people. It's not about being a buddy, buddy. And yes, in Ephesians, Paul says that we are we are brothers to Christ Jesus. We are joint heirs. And not merely about it's really not merely about inheritance. We all love that. Oh wow, we have an inheritance with God. It is about responsibility and accountability. And this responsibility and accountability to become the brother of Jesus Christ, to become the sister of Jesus Christ, also then therefore requires us to be like him. That wanting that desire to be like him. We bring Sacrifices of fools because we come and we desire what we want and the focus is ourselves. We have lost the reverence and honour for the Lord. We have lost the reverence and honour of the Lord. We no longer come in splendour and no longer do we come in awe. You know, we think that, wow, Jesus called the apostles and, 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 and the disciples brothers and, and friends. But look at how they honoured him. Now, none of them in their letters, none of them gave us a connotation that he was a, they are a buddy-buddy with Jesus. They call him Lord. They call him Savior. They, they call him who he is, the Son of the living God. I pray, I wish really that, you know, 
we take examples of them and even examples of the fathers of our of our faith uh, Abraham and Moses and even the prophets how they look up to God and how they revere him how they look up to him to them and say that you are my God and indeed in your presence I stand in awe and sometimes I think that it is people like us who are pastors and leaders and teachers who give us give that wrong message I pray today we we look at ourselves we, we look at our messages we look at our lips each of us look at our lips what comes up from our lips do our lips then therefore praise the Lord do our lips then therefore uh, not uh, bargain with him but know that he is the one to be worshipped and revered do our lips even brother to brother brother to sister do our lips then therefore speak of love and care and edification and encouragement those are wonderful sacrifices through the Lord I want us to learn to bless I want to read Hebrews 12 to all of us Hebrews 12 28 and Hebrews 12 28 says this therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is who God is. This is who God is. Let's stand in awe of who He is. Let us be men and women of few words. Let's come with a posture that we know the reason why we are coming to worship Him. It's not about being fashionable. You know, and not about family. Friends, hear this. I know many people go to church because their family members go with them or their parents bring them. Those of you who go with your family, Jesus wants you to be in a relationship with Him personally. God wants you to be in a personal relationship with Him. So I want you to not just come with your family, but come to know who this God who loves you and who died on the cross for you, who took your place and who gave you mercy and grace. Coming to God is not about festival or, or, or to, to worship, is or to use God for your own means because at the end of the day, we want to come and worship God for who He is. So first is foolish worship, first red flag. Second red flag is abuse by those in power and this is found in verse 8 and 9 if you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied do not be surprised at such things for one official is eyed by a higher one and over them both are others higher still the increase from the land is taken by all the king himself profits from the fields what is saying is this don't be surprised Layers, there will be layers and layers of oppression. The king will oppress the noblemen who will in turn oppress the landowners and the merchants who will all in turn together or perhaps all together that oppress the peasants and the slaves. There is a pecking order of oppression. Proverbs 22, 16 tells us that the oppression of the poor okay, to, to be rich is something that we will happen and it is wrong. Then, and James 5, you know, every workman is worth his wages, but wages which are withheld, it is wrong also. So what about today? Do we see, uh, uh, do we see unfair practices in, 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 for, from those in power? It still happens. An unkind boss, I've seen unkind bosses who change the targets just when his salespeople are about to reach this target and to get the commission and to get all their benefits, they move the targets a little bit higher and they say oh we move it a little bit higher but we give it a little bit more incentives but that, this is the oppression of your people you know it, it is also when when people talk about pay cuts and they say okay this is a bad time let's all have our pay cuts but when things are, are, are okay you don't see the restoration of uh, the pay cuts and and sometimes I have seen this before with my own eyes the boss decided, well, I'm not going to give you your restoration of your pay cuts. I'm going to buy a Mercedes. 
What a treachery. What a treachery. But those things happen. How about nepotism and favoritism? People that are in their own family, they will promote, and, and they are favorite people that they will. These are the oppression of the people who are poor. These are the oppression of people who are unable, the powerless. What about corruption? Yes, there is corruption. Even governments uh, uh, abuse power. I mean, I, I, I remember, and I think some of you have read about the Red Bull case in Thailand, where uh, the, the heir to the Red Bull uh, uh, business ran over a policeman and got killed and killed the policeman, you know, and, and he gets and gets caught free. What about uh, in India, where the rich will get their court cases quickly uh, attended to, and there are people who are in prison ten years, twelve years, and yet to be their cases are yet to be heard after one after after the one the one time after ten years. What about Cyprus government? You know, I mean, when I read. Uh, an article on this, it, it took me by surprise. The government making a decision and say, I am going to lock off money from your savings. In 2013, Cyprus was facing a, a financial crisis. And what the government did was that they went to Cyprus, Bank of Cyprus and said, anyone who has 100,000 uh, 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 savings or more, we are taking 20% from, from, from them. Arbitrarily, you know, this is the law. We pass a law. We are taking all this from you. There is corruption, there is the oppression of the poor. People are bullied. So what he's saying here is, is don't be surprised. You know, I'm very thankful. I really am thankful that I'm living in Singapore. We are not perfect, but we definitely don't see a lot of all these problems that many countries have. Though I want to red flag here. I agree with Solomon's red flag because Christians we too can be sucked into this system of life. We too can, be, can become like these people when we are in position of power, especially in position in power under the sun. Christian, you and I need to be different because we too can be caught up in this. Always remember one thing first, that God is watching. God is watching over us. Is Proverbs 15 3 go and read he is watching over the good and the evil you know God is God who is not uh, partial he will look at us and he wants us to be guided by our the principles found in the Bible if the wages are to be paid to the people then pay the right wages if the people are supposed to receive benefits then treat them fairly as in Colossians 4 1 Treat your people fairly. And this is one area which I really uh, am, am concerned because it is easy for many Christians to climb into positions of, of, of power. And therefore, we have to every day check ourselves to look at the principles found in the scripture. There are many principles found in the, in the scripture. I've given you two only. So how it will guide you to be to be not those who abuse power, but to be those who are compassionate and to be those who will help others and who will be fair to the people who are below us, who are people who are powerless. So foolish worship, one. Two, abuse of the powerful. Three, is having much, but on the other side, it seems to have nothing. You seem to have nothing. And this is found in verse 10 onwards to the end of chapter 5, verse 20. Let me just read to you. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of his owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, 
and as he comes, so he departs. He makes he takes nothing from his labor, and he can carry that he can carry in his hand. This too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs, and what does he gain, since he toils all the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Verse 18. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his toilsome labor. Under the sun, during the few days of his life, God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possession and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work. This is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. What is he saying here? So clearly, so clearly. You accumulate much, but you have nothing. Then General Douglas MacArthur, you know, reading his biography was very interesting. There was a part when after he came back into Philippines, the Philippines and he went uh, to Manila and they were uh, watching the Japanese uh, soldiers retreating out of, getting out of uh, Manila. Well, the Japanese soldiers began to, to rampage the whole place. They were burning homes and houses after house. So what happened was that the little phrase there was very interesting. Douglas MacArthur could only stand and see his house and his valuable paintings burned. Every of his wonderful uh, possession completely destroyed. It is so, so interesting because wealth, money, and possession, the promises of fulfillment of life, of satisfaction, can just disappear in a moment's time. Your Prada, your LV can disappear in a moment's time. Verse 10 says this, it says that whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Whoever loves money will never be satisfied. You know, money is indeed a very bad mistress. I'm going to read from a quotation of Benjamin Franklin. It says this, Ben Franklin says, nothing in the nature of money produces happiness. The more money a man has, the more he wants. And instead of filling a vacuum, it makes another one. You know what's irony? The irony is this. Benjamin Franklin's face is on the US $100 bill. And But then isn't that true? That you will never have enough. The possessions will never be enough. You know, he, uh, and Solomon echoes what Job says in uh, chapter 1, Job chapter 121, that naked I come from my mother's womb and naked I return. You know, you don't hold your possessions in your hand and say, I can bring it along to the next life. Money, however, is not a problem, friends. Money is what we need as a form of exchange. But 1 Timothy 6 says this, that the love of money is the root to all evil. And there is no peace. No peace for the one who has so much money. Verse 12, it says that the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. There is no sleep because why? There is no rest because he keeps thinking what will happen? What if tomorrow's stock market goes down? What if this thing happens? What if COVID-19 doesn't, there's no breakthrough, there's no vaccine? And so there's always a lot of what if, and then he lies down. And what if someone takes it away. You know, someone said that uh, he won lot a lottery, you know, and when it was announced that he was the winner, he suddenly found new relatives. Somebody will come and take it away. And in verse 17, he continues to say, what are the perils? He says, all these days, he eats in darkness, and he gets, he's got great frus uh, frustration, he's afflicted, he's in anger, you know, and he talks about hoarding. You know, when you hoard things, what will happen is that you're not generous. You hold things to yourself. You're afraid that it's being stolen. Ben Midler, that singer, because she was so afraid that people would steal her money away, decided to say, pay me in gold. 
maybe people couldn't come and take her gold away. But you must not forget, there has been a lot of gold robbery. Well, it takes place. You may lose in an in investment, a lifetime's labor and savings may be lost in one instant. And it could be lost in one big mistake. Jeff Bezos, he gave $38 billion to his ex-wife as a payment for divorce settlement. Yes, today he's still $190 over billion dollars rich, but he, he just lost 38. He could have been 200 over billion. You know why we accumulate and want to accumulate? Why is money you know, such a companion that we feel comfortable and we want more? Because we are trying to find satisfaction under the sun because nothing else Nothing else seems to give us meaning. And yet there is no meaning here. The thing about it is this, friends, greed, greed is more, is, a, is, is, is something which this society keeps wanting more and more. And I'm going to say this to us, believers, we, you and I, I found a lot of us are still not out of under the sun because we are still dissatisfied some of us already have a car, but we look at car uh, uh, magazines every time because we yearn to have a car that gives us a better ride, maybe a better feature, keyless uh, start, keyless entry. You know, uh, my the, the last car I had was, I still had to use a key to start a car, still had a key to open the door and someone was looking at it and said, no, Pastor, do you know that there are cars without keys anymore? Yeah, hallelujah for that. You know, we want a nicer home. We want a better vacation. This last vacation place is not good. Let's go for a better one. But do you realize something? It will never satisfy. Because for most of us, the moment we land in, in Changi Airport, we were thinking of the next one, the next vacation. Because why? The last one couldn't satisfy us. We want more handbags. We want more uh, mobile phones, new ones. We cannot drink. Uh, Kopi Tiam Coffee, we must, it must be Starbucks. I know some of you are already turning off the, 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 your, your video. No, don't please stay with me. It is okay to give yourself a treat once in a while. Well, a treat for a new car, a treat at Starbucks or a coffee bean. You know, but I still have my, my, my peep about it. You know, once I went to Coffee Bean and I wanted a coffee, you know, but I look at it and I look at the price and I thought about the difference between uh, Kopi O at uh, Kopi Tiam and I decided, now let's walk, let me walk to the Kopi Tiam because I thought of the person who, who could use the difference for one meal. You know, I, I, it's, it's just something, you know, I, it, but the thing about it is this, when we look at all of these things, you know, my brothers and my, and my brothers and my sisters, we think that this will give us a good life. It, it will that life will be good, but the truth is this: it will not satisfy you and I. You know, Jesus spoke most about money. Not well, maybe prophetically, he could see that money is going to be a big problem for us, a major struggle for us. You know, one of these days, uh, I will take some time to talk about debt and a monetary system. Uh, so that we can understand and that maybe before that just one point friends get yourselves out of debt as soon as possible as much as possible let me let me continue so how what do we do let us be guided by biblical principles biblical truths about money i'm going to just rattle and give you some verses write it down let them be your guide and there are many more matthew 6 21 where your treasure is so your heart is. Uh, Psalm 37, 16 to 17, better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. Power and wicked will be broken. Hebrews 13, 5, be free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for God is with you. And God is with you. Isn't God enough? Matthew 6, 24, you can't serve two masters at the same time. Matthew 19, 21, sell your possessions and follow me. 1 Timothy 6, 10, love, the love of money. Pierce, the people who love money, pierce themselves with grief. 
don't covet Exodus 20, 17. Do not covet after your neighbor's house, goods, wife. Do not covet. Do not yearn for the possession of those things. Don't look at someone else and say, this person has this, I, I wish I had. It will be insatiable. It will never be enough. Lead your life or walk your life by the principles of God. Fourth flag is this. There will be dissatisfaction of life's experience. And this is going to be a long read. It's going to be from the whole of chapter 6. And it reads like this. I have seen another evil under the sun and it weighs heavily on men. God gives men wealth, possession and honour so that he lacks nothing his heart's desire. But God does not enable him to enjoy them and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, and yet, no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, this stillborn child has more rest than that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place. All man's effort are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. What advantage has a man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better that the eyes sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Verse 10. Whatever exists has already been named and what, and what man has is has been known. No man can contend with one who is stronger than he. The more the words, the less the meaning. And now, and how does the, that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a man in this life? During the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone. What is Solomon saying here? He says that we will experience many things, we will be given, bestowed many things, but all of it has got no meaning because there is nothing that will satisfy. It is actually a very depressing chapter. But what he's saying here is that as you go through life and you have lots of and lots of experience, lots and lots of possession. But it is not better than a still one childhood. Experience nothing because why? The appetite of a man on this earth under the sun is not satisfying. There's no meaning. So, I mean, we can say this, okay, I've been through that. So what? I've done that. So what? The moment somebody said this, the moment we are born, we are preparing to die. That's actually a very sad way of looking at life. No matter what is your status, Solomon is writing here, whether you are the highest of the high or the lowest of the low, no matter how much you have or how little you have, no matter what you have achieved and what you have not achieved, at the end of the day, mankind cannot be satisfied by any experience that is under the sun. Because when he goes, he doesn't know what it all means altogether. For us Christians, those of us, we say that we believe in God, we too sometimes ask ourselves, what is this whole meaning of life? And so therefore, what we do is that we search for meaning and we search for purpose. We, we follow and, and try to follow what is in the scriptures. We have to do good. Okay? What are the things that we can do to do good? Uh, feed the poor, clothe them, give them a, a, a roof over their heads, meet the needy, go to the prison, speak to the prisoner, save the environment, save the wills, fight abortion. Now friends, all these are good stuff. But there's a question we need to ask. The question is why are you doing all these? Is it an existential reason to prove that I'm alive? Or is it that you say I follow biblical principles? And if you say that you follow biblical principles, I say great, my brothers and sisters, my friend, 
But why do you follow biblical principles? What is your reason behind it? Some of us will say that, well, the reason behind it is that as I follow the biblical principles, I say, I can afford the time, I can afford the, the, the finances, the money, the dollars and cents to give to the poor, time with the, 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 the prisoners. I can have uh, the time to look at all the saving the world, saving the environment. Others will say, well, it, it is a good feeling. It's a good feeling to help others. I cannot deny it is a good feeling to help others. But if we just do that for the sake of doing it, let me ask you, don't you feel that you come to a point in time that this doing good thing is just a pat on your own shoulder? And you're not, you're not just doing it for someone else, but you're doing it for yourself? That you accomplish it sometimes even to say, God, see, I did it. You know, friends, what if, let me ask you this, what if you are asked to go beyond, beyond what you can afford, beyond what you can afford in terms, in terms of time, would you still be engaged in uh, meeting the poor, seeing them, talking to them, visiting the prisoner? If you are asked to go beyond what you can afford in terms of dollars and cents, because Jesus, remember he says, sell your possession and follow me. Would you sell your possession and follow him just because he asks you to give up an interest so they have more time? See, my question here is this, how long can you sustain it? How long can any one of us sustain it? How can any one of us stop, you know, continue if we don't feel good about it anymore, about doing something anymore? We can be guided by principles and values in the Bible, but my dear friends, the principles, the values, the wisdom words, and the, even the commands of the Bible are merely ink on paper. They are merely ink on paper because we are still under the sun. We cannot hold on. These are not anchors that we can hold on until and unless they are found. These are found anchored in the one who breathes life into them. There's one who gives meaning into the principles, the values, the wisdom words, and even the commands, and therefore give meaning to life itself. And that is no one else other than the one who came from above the Son, Jesus Christ himself. You see, we need to have somebody who comes from above the Son to know what it means to have purpose and life and meaning, not only for the eternity, but even for life here on this earth, under the sun, we can have a fulfillment, a meaningful life here. See, God sent Jesus Christ and, and, and He is the answer to all the perils. He came so that we, who, we, we, we can't clean up ourselves to be worthy to come to Him. The Jews came to Him at the temple and asked for, for cleansing. And we can't do that. But it is Jesus coming to us he who is God, tabernacle with us, the good shepherd who leads and guides us by his Holy Spirit and by his word. He who came so that the principles can sustain us because we have a wise counsel. He who came who made us clean so that we are able to come to the Father. And we who are clean can be cleansed, cleansed in our lips. We will not come and, and, and bargain with God because he is enough. He who came allow us to say we don't need to negotiate with God because He is the one who gives us His best throughout. We can trust Him for that. And He who came so that our lips are cleansed, so that we, are, we, speak, word, we speak words of love and care and words of, of, of edification and words of encouragement rather than words that bring people down. He came so that in His death, and resurrection, we learn how to revere Him. We learn how to worship His name. We learn how to be awestruck. He came to show us what it means to worship Him in spirit and in truth. But at the same time also, He came to show us 
what it means to come down from a place of power, to be humble, to serve the people. You know, friends, as I said just now, that when we get into positions of power, we too can slip into a place where we are abusive. But even as we continue to try and use the biblical principles, unless we frame it in Jesus Christ, unless we are able to see in Jesus is this whole counsel of how to live life, unless we do that, we will find it so difficult. Because Jesus came from the heavens. Jesus stepped down from his heavenly throne to show us what it means to be humble, to show us what it means to be to have compassion for others, to show us what it means to be giving, to show us what it means to have God-centered uh, ambitions, to show us what it means to be selfless, to show us what it means to be always otherward and not me -word. Jesus came also to remind us that in Him is not only eternal life, but every spiritual blessing. That we do not need to run after money. We do not need to cradle at dollars and cents, which we cannot bring along with us when we die. But He has given us the wonderful eternal life. And not only that, one beautiful truth is this, that in Christ Jesus, there are so many truths, but there's one beautiful truth that we have, that in Christ Jesus, God calls us His sons and His daughters. You and I are children of the living God, the creator of men and women and this whole earth. He calls you and I sons and daughters. We are adopted. We are, we are, his, we are his children. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. I mean, when you sit down and think about it, I don't think any money can, can buy us such a position. And so it teaches us one thing. It teaches us that is there anything else you need to desire for? I think we have not sat down enough to be quiet before God to say, God, am I able to fathom who you are? And when I'm able to, Lord, you are enough. You know, we sing songs like, Christ is enough for me. But do we really mean Christ is enough for me? Or are we looking for other things to satisfy this life? Let's take a look at our life. Let's re-examine our walk, our journey with the Lord. Let's examine our knowledge and understanding of who God is. Let us fall so deeply and madly in love with Jesus Christ to say that He is enough for us. One way, my dear friends, to living that life, that money is no longer uh, something that we desire or will satisfy us is to to live con to that to live content is to to serve others sacrificially serve sacrificially with the time jesus is the supreme example of sacrificial service he gave up his all for us give up your time your money when it is when it is required of you and i romans 8 32 isn't it said that God did not spare his own son? He did not withhold his best, but God gave him up for us. It is a blessing to give. It is a blessing to serve others sacrificially. And most of all, when we do that, you know, friends, we step into the footprints of Jesus Christ. You walk into his footprints and you will find how wonderful it is and to be blessed by Him. Only in God and in Christ Jesus will we not only be satisfied, but we are able to live above and beyond the perils and the dangers that Solomon has spoken. Do you want to have meaning and purpose? It is Jesus. Unless Jesus is the reason, and unless the Holy Spirit is the source, all the things that we do, all the, all the things that we try, will be our own effort. And I will tell you that it will be, it will, you can't last. 
even when we talk about wanting to help the poor and, and meet the needy's needs and, and to see the prisoners, it will just be, it will just not last for us. And we will not find true meaning. The source must be from God himself. And let me tell you, if, it is, if the source is not God himself, if it is not Jesus himself, then I will tell you that we really fall into the danger of making ourselves feel good, patting ourselves on the shoulder and thinking that we have earned enough scout points for God to see. Let's subject ourselves to Jesus. I close with what Pastor Tony last week shared. And he said, he said that unless we learn to love one another, which is a command, let me remind us that it is a command from Jesus, a new command I give to you. Unless we love one another, all that we do outside, all that we do beyond hopes, no meaning. So my friends, I pray this morning that even as you, after this sermon, spend some time in, in reflection, think about your journey. Some of you, you will find that you will have difficulties or had difficulties in terms of worship. Then ask the Lord to give you His grace to teach you how to worship Him. To let you, let you see how great He is, how great is our God. And let your words be few. Some of you will find that you are in places of power and for, for a, a, a time you have, you have abuse. I'll ask, ask God for forgiveness and ask the Holy Spirit now to teach you how to apply those principles to be alive in Christ Jesus. Some of us, well, we have a lot of possessions. Maybe God is asking, don't hoard, you know, sell it, give it to somebody, you know, pass it on to those who need and give and serve. It's, and there will be a time when the Lord will say, can you give me sacrificially? And last but not least, Find meaning and purpose in the Lord. In all that you do, unless He is the one who is who is guiding you to it, and He is the one that you're doing for and to as a worship to His name, all of it will be useless. Meaningless. Find meaning in the Lord as we continue to seek after Him. May His grace and His mercy be sufficient. Lord, we want to thank you for Solomon's word. The Lord, even in 5 and 6 chapter of Ecclesiastes, his warnings, his, his red flags tells us that we too can fall into uh, living under the sun. But we have your principles and your values and your wise wisdom words and your commands, but we pray that they are not just used as wise words and rules and regulations, but they are alive in us because of Christ Jesus. So Jesus, help us to abide in you. Help us to frame our life in you. And we no longer want to live under the sun, but we want to live with you above the sun. Give us, O Lord, your grace and your mercy. This day, O Lord, be glorified. We pray and ask you because we pray in your name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.